I want you to do a 100% back though. Powerful girls say the day. Sugar, spice, and everything nice, plus a dash of Chemical X for good measure. These were the ingredients chosen to create three of the most iconic animated superheroes of the 1990s, the Powerpuff Girls. With two animated series, multiple TV specials, a movie, and mountains of merchandise to their name, Blossom, Bubbles, and Buttercup are the very definition of girl power. Hi everyone, I'm Neil McNeil with Channel Frederator, and today we're counting down the 107 facts you should know about the Powerpuff Girls. Are you a diehard fan or just wondering if it's worth a watch? We've got something for everyone, so let's get started. Fact number one, series creator Craig McCracken first sketched the Powerpuff Girls on a piece of construction paper while attending CalArts in 1991. But it wasn't for an animated project, at least not initially. The girls were part of a design for a birthday card that McCracken was creating for his younger brother. Number two, the original drawing was only about an inch tall and featured bubbles dressed in green and buttercup dressed in blue, but McCracken swapped the colors the next time he drew them. Number three, the Powerpuff Girls designs were based off of Margaret Keene's paintings, you know, the ones with the really big sad eyes. McCracken picked Keene's paintings because he found them to be funny. Number four, their feet were designed to resemble socks filled with wet sand. I guess that's where all the sugar and spice ended up. Number five, Blossom, Bubbles, and Buttercup have no fingers because their original drawing was so tiny that McCracken couldn't fit fingers in. At one point, he tried to give the girls fingers, but it didn't really look right. He decided that the fingers and noses would mar the beauty of their design. Number six, McCracken tried to reflect the girls' personalities in each of their own designs. Blossom has a bow because she's the leader and it functions more like a crown. Bubbles has soft, girly pigtails because she's the cute one. And Buttercup has angry and edgy bobbed hair to reflect her tough tood. Number seven, McCracken sees the girls as three pieces of a whole person, with Blossom representing the mind, Buttercup symbolizing the body, and Bubbles taking on the role of the spirit. Because of this, they're much stronger taking on bad guys together than they are fighting solo. Number eight, the Powerpuff Girls' toughest fighter on the team was originally named Bud to fit her tomboyish demeanor, but something about that name rubbed McCracken the wrong way. It was his friend Miles Thompson that later suggested that whatever name he settled on would end up being synonymous with the word tough, and that's how he ended up with Buttercup. Number nine, McCracken wound up becoming so attached to these characters that he scrapped an entire animated project for Cal Art about a super-powered Mexican wrestler named El Fuego in favor of giving these girls the spotlight. Number 10, McCracken switched from a luchador to little girls because he loved the contrast of three innocent-looking little girls kicking the collective butts of big, tough bad guys. Number 11, sugar, spice, and everything nice. These were the ingredients chosen by Professor Utonium and also the ingredients listed in the What Are Little Boys Made Of nursery rhyme. Number 12, they might be made of sugar, spice, and everything nice and Chemical X, but the original original Powerpuff recipe was slightly different. Instead of Chemical X, their powers came from a can of whoop-ass. And you probably don't need us to tell you why the name had to be changed in order to be aired on the network whose target demographic is children, but for the time being, they were called the Whoop-Ass Girls. Number 13, McCracken originally planned to have four short films revolving around the Whoop-Ass Girls. The original short was called Whoop-Ass Stew, which McCracken created when he was only 20 years old. Number 14, despite having a ludicrous concept, the Whoop-Ass Girls proved to be a great success for McCracken. The short was selected for the 1994 Festival of Animation, effectively launching his career. Number 15, McCracken's teacher suggested that he show his first film to Lisa Szymanski of Nickelodeon Studios Development. Szymanski said that she saw real talent, but the project at the time wasn't exactly in the direction Nickelodeon was going. Number 16, McCracken then pitched the short to Margot Sandua of Hanna-Barbera, who then showed it to none other than the man himself, Fred Seibert, who was president of Hanna-Barbera at the time. Seibert immediately wanted to put the project into motion for a series. Number 17, McCracken was offered a job to work on Ren and Stimpy while he was in school. Luckily for us, he turned that job down and that year created the Powerpuff Girls. Number 18, at the time, Hanna-Barbera started reconfiguring and Cybert launched What a Cartoon, a program that served as a launch pad for 82 animated shorts with the potential for fully-fledged Hanna-Barbera series. While the Powerpuff Girls may have gotten their start there, some of your other animated favorites did as well, including Dexter's Laboratory, Johnny Bravo, Cow and Chicken, Courage the Cowardly Dog, Whatever Happened to Robot Jones, Sheep in the Big City, Codename Kids Next Door, The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy, and even Family Guy. Thanks again, Fred. Number 19, February 20th, 1995, is a historic day in Powerpuff history that every fan should know. It was the day that the first Powerpuff Girls short, Meet Fuzzy Lumpkins, was unveiled to the world during Cartoon Network's World Premiere Tunes program. Number 20, when Powerpuff Girls was tested in a focus group of children, it did not go over well. The show had a personality and attitude that no one had seen, and it really needed a learning curve. Regardless, execs rallied for it and encouraged McCracken to work on a second short with his characters. Number 21, one of the complaints was that people thought 
thought that the girls were bugs. McCracken then went in and tried to completely redesign the girls within a day, giving them more realistic features from their faces to their figures. Luckily, nothing became of those redesigns and McCracken's unique image for the girls remained. Number 22. While he was trying to get the Powerpuff Girls on the air, McCracken was helping a friend from CalArts named Gendy Tartakovsky on a little show of his called Dexter's Laboratory. During his time on the show as an art director, McCracken learned that the characters are the most important things to making a show work. So he tossed out the idea of making the show about backgrounds and colored Townsville with entertaining and memorable characters. Number 23, McCracken's work on Dexter's Laboratory paid off when it proved to Cartoon Network executives that he was quite effective in incorporating a unique sense of humor into his method of telling stories. This gave Cartoon Network the confidence to greenlight Craig's show. Number 24, it's not always what you know that will lead you to success, but sometimes who you know. Quite a few of the key members of the Powerpuff Girls staff were friends of McCracken's during his time at CalArts, including storyboard artist Paul Rudish, storyboard art and director Rob Renzetti, and the aforementioned Gindy Tartakovsky. Number 25. McCracken was still deeply attached to the name Whoop-Ass Girls, but Adult Swim wouldn't exist for another few years, so he needed a cleaner name for the show to air. You can thank Rudish for giving their girls the G-rated moniker. Number 26. This meant that the show needed a replacement for the can of Whoop-Ass that gave the girls their power. They went for the mysterious substance we now know as Chemical X. It was widely believed that this was referring to ecstasy, but that myth has been busted by McCracken himself. Number 27, McCracken cites the 1966 Batman television series and cartoons by Jay Ward as two of the biggest influences on the show. If you're unfamiliar with Jay Ward, he's the man behind such characters as Rocky and Bullwinkle. And if you're unfamiliar with Batman, it might be a good time for you to leave that cozy little rock that you've apparently been living under. Number 28, to make the girls stand out from the rest of their world, they were designed exclusively with curves, round shapes, and ellipses, while the background characters and environments follow a more angular style influenced by 50s and 60s cartoons. Number 29, when coming up with the villains, McCracken created a mental spectrum running from evil to dumb. The Amoeba Boys, for example, were at the furthest end of stupid, whereas him is pure evil. Mojo Jojo is right in the middle and can be pushed either way. Number 30, Mojo Jojo's design is based on a villain named Dr. Gori from a Japanese anime from the 1970s called Spectre Man. Much like Mojo Jojo, Dr. Dr. Gory was also an evil green-faced monkey. Number 31, the Green Gang was created out of the question, what if Big Daddy Roth designed Fat Albert and the Cosby Kids? If you're unfamiliar, Big Daddy Roth was a cartoonist responsible for creating such characters as Rat Fink, who was designed to be an anti-Mickey Mouse. Number 32, him was originally supposed to be named Devil, but Cartoon Network refused to allow a religious reference on their show. Number 33, despite originally being named after the Devil, him's initial design was based off of the Blue Meanies from the 1968 Beatles film Yellow Submarine. Number 34, Fuzzy Lumpkins is based on a sidekick character from Rainbow Bright. Number 35, the mayor of Townsville was designed to be a hybrid of the Monopoly Man and Mayor McCheese? Yep the mayor of McDonaldland, which is a town that we can only assume has rampant issues of obesity and heart disease. Number 36, you never see Miss Bellum's face because her best feature is her mind. McCracken did this because he wanted to make a commentary about how women are often only seen for their bodies. Number 37, ironically, Professor Utonium himself was created from a mixture of ingredients. He was a mixture of a TV father from the 1950s and J.R. Bob Dobbs from Church of the Subgeniuses. Number 38, Professor Utonium's house is based off of the Arpel Villa from the 1958 film Mon Uncle. Number 39, out of the three girls, Bubbles was the hardest voice to cast. Many of the actresses that auditioned were capable of doing a cute voice, but McCracken found them to be too cute to the point that they were just flat out irritating to listen to. Number 40, the original Bubbles' adorable voice is the work of a legendary voice actress, Tara Strong. In the off chance that you don't know her by name now, she's played Timmy Turner on The Fairly Odd Parents, Raven on Teen Titans, and Twilight Sparkle on My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic. Number 41, the voice of the Powerpuff Girls' fearless leader Blossom is provided by Kathy Cavadini, who has seemed to embrace the animated superhero genre throughout her career, having also appeared in Justice League Unlimited, Teen Titans, and Batman the Brave and the Bold. Number 42, Buttercup's tough tongue is spoken by voice actress E.G. Daly, who is perhaps best known for playing Tommy Pickles on the Rugrats. And this isn't the only time that E.G. Daly has played the on-screen sibling of Strong, since Tara also voiced Tommy's brother, Dill Pickle, on the Rugrats. Number 43, Tom Kenny plays not one, but two two principal roles on the show, both the mayor of Townsville and the show's narrator. This prolific actor has appeared in all three of McCracken's shows, playing Eduardo in Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends and Commander Peepers in Wander Over Yonder. Number 44, a lot of Kenny's narrator lines at the end of every episode were improvised, or as McCracken likes to call them, wacky make-em-ups. 
Number 45, Professor Utonium is voiced by Tom Kane, who you can hear as Yoda in just about any Star Wars video game or TV show. He also played Oxnard Montalvo in The Angry Beavers, Darwin in The Wild Thornberries, and in the biggest twist of all, he also voiced him and the talking dog on the show. Number 46, the Powerpuff Girls teacher, Miss Keen, is played by the voice actress Jennifer Hale. This is quite an unusually tame role for Hale, as she's better known for playing hardcore heroes like Sam on Totally Spies and Commander Shepard in the Mass Effect trilogy. Number 47, Mojo Jojo's rapidly repetitive speech was performed by Roger Jackson, who has provided the voice for a much more intense villain, the ghost face killer in the Scream franchise. Number 48, Mojo Jojo's voice was inspired by Speed Racer. No, not Speed's pet chimp, but rather the rhythmic style of the dubbed dialogue. His speech patterns were also inspired by a DC Comics dictionary that McCracken used to read as a child that would define words in a sentence and then reiterate the definition over and over again. Number 49, while the pre-production phase of development was done by McCracken and his crew, much of the Powerpuff Girls actual animation was done by a Korean animation studio called Rough Draft. Rough Draft's resume includes work done by other animated classics like Futurama, The Simpsons, and SpongeBob SquarePants. Number 50, one of the obstacles faced by the show's production was none other than The Legend of Zelda, Ocarina Arena of Time, which had just come out when the show was getting started. People were handing in their storyboards late, and production on the show was stalled for about a month so that everyone on the staff could liberate Hyrule from the evil Ganondorf. Number 51, this setback was subtly alluded to in the episode Child Fearing, in which the mayor places his responsibilities in the hands of Mojo Jojo so he can play a game that looks identical to Ocarina of Time. Number 52, McCracken actually met his wife Laura Faust on the staff of the Powerpuff Girls. She was a story artist. He asked about her almost immediately after seeing her and even ran her board test by Tartakovsky to make sure his judgment wasn't clouded. Number 53, Faust has also worked on all of McCracken's shows and is currently the creator and showrunner of My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic. From Powerpuff Girls to Ponies, Faust has done it all. Number 54, there's an entire musical episode called See Me, Feel Me, Know Me. The episode never aired in the US but is still available on iTunes and Netflix. The inspiration for the episode came after the success of the opera on Dexter's Laboratory, so the Powerpuff Girls team figured that they would want a rock opera for the Powerpuff Girls. Number 55, Craig wanted the show to be scored like a movie where the music emotionally builds and moves based on the emotions in the story. The show's composer, James L. Venable, first did the show's score as being a combination of music found in a 50s horror and big beat techno. Number 56, Venable also said that each girl has their own sound. Blossom is associated with brass heroic sounds, Bubbles has a belly cute sound, whatever that means, and Buttercup has a rock edgy sound. Number 57, the show's original theme song was created and performed by Scottish techno punk band Biss. They saw the potential that cartoons had in promoting a band's music after the South Park theme song boosted record sales and awareness for the band behind the theme, Primus. Number 58, without Hanna-Barbera, there would be no Powerpuff Girls, so McCracken and his crew made sure to pay homage to the studio on quite a few occasions. In the episode Hot Air Buffloon, Fred Flintstone and Barney Rubble can be seen robbing a bank, and George Jetson makes an appearance in the episode Major Competition. Number 59, the bromance between McCracken and Tartakovsky is shown quite a few times throughout the series, with Tartakovsky's Dexter making a few special guest appearances throughout the city of Townsville. He has appeared in Criss Cross Crisis, Forced Kin, and even with a plush version of him appearing in Ploys R Us. Number 60, while the girls themselves never appeared on Dexter's Laboratory, they did appear on the variant comic book cover of Dexter's Laboratory number 1. Number 61, every episode of the series opens with Kenny's iconic line, The City of Townsville. That's one dedicated narrator. Number 62, the location of Townsville is stated in the episode Him Diddle Riddle. This set of coordinates would put Townsville in the Pacific Ocean, southeast of Japan. Number 63, little did McCracken know the city of Townsville actually exists in Queensland, Australia. Guess they didn't teach Australian geography at Cal Arts. Number 64, despite having different hair color and eye color, McCracken still refers to them as identical triplets. Number 65, Buttercup is the only Powerpuff Girl without a unique power as revealed in the episode Nothing Special. Bubbles can speak different languages as well as talk to animals, and Blossom has ice breath. But as it turns out, Buttercup is the only one in all of Townsville who can curl her tongue. Not even Gene Simmons can do that. Number 66, Blossom, Bubbles, and Buttercup are five years old, as ever by their status as kindergartners. Number 67, the Powerpuff Girls celebrity status means that they're well connected to other pop culture icons like Princess Leia from Star Wars who attended their birthday party. Number 68, why does Mojo Jojo wear such a tall helmet? Well, it's used to cover and protect his obnoxiously large and exposed brain. We bet you'd like to unhear that one. Number 69, Mojo Jojo didn't always have his mojo. In the episode Mr. Jojo's Rising, it's revealed that Mojo Jojo was one of Professor Utonium's lab assistants and was just named Jojo. Number 70, the show's opening sequence leaves out one tiny detail 
know regarding the girls' origins. They were technically created by their arch nemesis, Mojo Jojo. When Professor Utonium was testing his formula for the perfect little girl, Jojo pushed him, causing the professor to accidentally knock the chemical X into the other three ingredients. Number 71, Sarabellum lives at 69, Yodelina Valley Way. Real mature, guys. Number 72, there's a clever episode called Collector, where the villain, Lenny Baxter, is collecting all of the Powerpuff Girls merchandise. But they didn't want to use any of the real merchandise, or the episode would have been seen as a commercial. So the team came up with the most obscure products, like meat packing papers, golf clubs, and waffle makers. It would seem that the merchandising people saw this episode and took notes because not long after the show, the Powerpuff Girls waffle maker was actually a thing. Number 73 in Boogie Fright, the scene where the Powerpuffs destroy the disco ball, is an homage to a similar sequence in Star Wars Episode 4, A New Hope, where Luke Skywalker uses the Force to destroy the Death Star. Number 74, there's a reference to Bob Ross's old PBS painting show, The Joy of Painting, in the episode Roughing It Up. The professor and the girls go out to paint in the woods, and the professor takes takes on Ross's relaxed way of speaking, and even stands behind a tree that gives him an afro. Number 75, in Dream Scheme, the professor tells the girls to go to bed, no buts and I mean it, to which Bubbles asks, does anybody want a peanut? In reference to the Princess Bride, where Fezzik can't stop rhyming things. Number 76, the Powerpuff Girls' childlike demeanor doesn't prevent it from referencing some of the more adult corners of pop culture. In Imaginary Friends, Blossom is thrown into a pile of clothes in the classroom and comes out dressed as Eric Cartman from South Park. She even mutters a word frequently spoken by Cartman. Seriously? Number 77, the Powerpuff Girls series premiered on November 18th, 1998, three years after the first short premiered. It was more than worth the wait. Number 78, the Powerpuff Girls was broadcast in 14 languages, and their names changed depending on the region. In France, they're Belle, Boule, and Ribelle. In Italy, they're Lolly, Dolly, and Molly. In Latin America, their names translate to Chocolate, Bubble, and Acorn. Number 79, the Powerpuff Girls TV debut in 1998 was the highest rated premiere in Cartoon Network history. The series can consistently scored the highest rating each week for the network across a wide range of demographics, young to old and male to female. Number 80, the show surprisingly took off with young boys. Before the Powerpuff Girls, it had been a long time standard in Hollywood that girl shows just didn't attract a mass audience, making shows based on girl topics a rarity. Since the Powerpuff Girls became a hit, that is no longer the case, with every network making more and more effort to create their own girl show. Number 81, within three weeks of the show being on air, Cartoon Network started getting calls about licensing and getting toys onto store shelves. By 2000, the Powerpuff Girls sold approximately 350 million in merchandise, ranking them among the toy industry's biggest performers. Number 82, the Powerpuff Girls released an alternate rock-driven soundtrack called Heroes and Villains. The Heroes and Villains CD features a variety of alternative bands performing songs that are true to the action of an episode of the Powerpuff Girls. The CD was a brainchild of Craig McCracken himself, who handpicked the bands that influenced both himself and the series. Number 83, McCracken knew that the Powerpuff Girls had become a phenomenon when he saw a an unlicensed Powerpuff Girls pinata on sale on the side of the road. Yes, he did buy one. In his mind, piracy was the sincerest form of flattery. Number 84, the Powerpuff Girls were so inspirational that they convinced the little girl living next door to McCracken to start flossing. It's a surprise that the mother didn't start pitching McCracken episode ideas revolving around the girls willingly taking out the garbage, doing the dishes, and scrubbing the toilet with no sass towards the professor. Number 85, the Powerpuff Girls' popularity could not be contained. The superpowered girls were featured on everything from a a sponsored NASCAR racing car to the sides of Delta airplanes. Number 86, the show won two primetime Emmys for Outstanding Achievement in Animation in both 2000 and 2005, and two Annie Awards in 2001. Number 87, the Powerpuff Girls Awards spanned well beyond the realm of animation, with the franchising picking up not one, but three awards at the International Licensing Industry Merchandisers Association Annual Awards Gala in 2001. Number 88, McCracken saw the toys as getting a little out of hand once they had gone into every girly territory with an excess in Powerpuff jewelry and pink becoming the main color associated with the merchandise as a whole. Craig stated that this very much went against what the Powerpuff Girls were and what they stood for. This inspired him to make the movie's primary focus on action, leading more towards the vibe of the whoop-ass girls in an attempt to diversify their public image. Number 89, the Powerpuff Girls movie was released on July 3rd, 2002. Despite its mixed reviews, the film managed to avoid a rotten status with a 63% rating. Not too shabby, girls. Number 90, the film itself was made for $25 million. Given how well the Powerpuff Girls merchandise was selling up until that point, it came as a huge surprise that the film only made $16.4 million worldwide, making the movie a box office flop. Number 91, one review of the movie that particularly stuck out to McCracken was that the film was an orgy of senseless and violent destruction. In hindsight, McCracken says he would have made it a little bit sillier and lighter, but is proud to say that it's certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. Number 
1992, McCracken left the series during its fourth season so that he could develop Foster's home for imaginary friends. The series was left in the capable hands of Chris Savino, who is now in the process of creating an animated show of his own for Nickelodeon called The Loud House. Number 93, in an unusual reversal of roles, Cartoon Network wanted a seventh season of the Powerpuff Girls. It was McCracken that decided that season six would be the last of the original series. Number 94, the original series ran from 1998 to 2005 with six seasons containing a grand total of 78 22-minute episodes under its belt. Number 95, the Powerpuff Girls exists as a TV show within a TV show in McCracken's other creation, Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. In the episode House of Blues, Mojo Jojo makes a cameo appearance as an unimaginative friend brought into existence by a kid who just copied what he saw on TV. At least the kid had a good taste in cartoons. Number 96, believe it or not, the Powerpuff Girls themselves have appeared in many episodes of Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. They're hiding in plain sight as a print design on Frankie Foster's shirt. Number 97, a destroyed city in Cartoon Network's Samurai Jack bears a striking resemblance to the city of Townsville and a recurring talking dog billboard that appears in both shows. Number 98, for the show's 10th anniversary, McCracken briefly returned to the Powerpuff Girls in 2008 for a special episode titled The Powerpuff Girls Rule, which Craig wrote and storyboarded. Number 99, 31 members of the original show's crew returned to work on the 10th anniversary Powerpuff Girls special. McCracken compared the episode's production to a band reunion. Number 100, the plot of the Powerpuff Girls 10th anniversary special, which revolves around the girls racing against villains to get the key to the world, was originally intended to be the plot of the Powerpuff Girls movie. Number 101, after doing a serious film adaptation of the Powerpuff Girls, McCracken was excited to get silly with the Powerpuff Girls rule and wrote in musical numbers. The numbers were parodies of The Little Mermaid's Part of Your World and Everybody Wants to Rule the World by Tears for Fears. Number 102, the animation director Eric Pringle researched the old episodes to get the same feel as the hand-drawn animation Rough Draft produced. In-betweens in Flash can have a very mathematical perfection that can appear a little too cold. So the team was removing a ton of frames, putting things on twos to get a warmer, more human feel, effectively blurring the line between hand drawn and digital. Number 103, Powerpuff Girls was adapted into a Japanese anime called Demashita, Powerpuff Girls Z. In it, Blossom, Bubbles, and Buttercup are just ordinary girls hit and transformed by one of Utonium's experiments. Number 104, Beatles drummer Ringo Starr provided his voice for the 2014 Powerpuff Girls Dance Pants. In the special, Ringo sings a song about how he wishes he was a Powerpuff Girl. Um, somebody direct that man to powerpuffyourself.com. Number 105, 20 years after the original premiere and 10 years after the end of the original series, the Powerpuff Girls returned to Cartoon Network with a reboot on April 9th, 2016. Number 106, unfortunately, McCracken is not involved with the reboot as he is working on Disney XD's Wander Over Yonder. Despite this, Kenny stated in an interview that the program had McCracken's blessing. Number 107, the 2016 reboot of the Powerpuff Girls is helmed by Nick Jennings and Bob Boyle. Jennings has served as the art director on Adventure Time, while Boyle created Wow Wow Webzy and was an art director on The Fairly Odd Parents. So, our beloved show is still in good hands. Thanks for watching the 107 facts you should know about the Powerpuff Girls. Puff Girls. Which girl is your favorite? Let us know in the comments down below. And if you liked what you just saw, be sure to check out some of our other 107 fact videos by clicking on the annotations or the links in the description below. And as always, be sure to subscribe to Channel Frederator so you don't miss out on any of our other videos. Because remember, Frederator loves you.